Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. In July 1816, the so-called Year Without a Summer, the U.S. military made war on an Apalachicola River outpost in Spanish Florida. It wasn't the Spanish who were attacked, however. It wasn't their fort. It also wasn't the British who were attacked, although they had built the fort. The Treaty of Ghent ended the U.S. war with Britain in 1815. So who was in this fort at Prospect Bluff, which stood in defense and defiance against any intruders? Historian Dale Cox, author of, appropriately enough, The Fort at Prospect Bluff, returns to the Seminole Wars podcast to explain who was in the fort and why the U.S. government viewed it as a threat, even though it operated in internationally recognized Spanish territory. Dale Cox, welcome back to the Seminole Wars. Well, thank you very much. I am very happy to be here. Dale, what was the fort at Prospect Bluff? The Fort in Prospect Bluff was a military station that was built during the War of 1812 by the British. Many people know it as a Negro fort, or as it later became known, Fort Gadsden. Dale, you wrote about this. What's the full title of your book? The full title is The Fort at Prospect Bluff, and the subtitle is The British Post on the Apalachicola and the Battle of Negro Fort. Was it formally called the Negro Fort? Well, that was a title that was actually given to it by United States officials in 1815 and 1816. Uh, the first person that I have found who used the term was Colonel Benjamin Hawkins, the U.S. agent for Indian Affairs. And he coined the term basically to make sure that U.S. officials all knew that this was a fort that was occupied by African Americans or in Pacific runaway slaves, primarily so that they would know that this fort was occupied in its latter days mostly by runaway slaves because he felt that it was a threat to the plantation slavery system in the southern United States. And he knew that by getting that point across, he could help U.S. officials in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere realize that this fort was a threat to, uh, especially to those officials from the southern United States, uh, realize that this fort was a threat to their, their livelihoods and their family as they knew them at that time. Hawkins, it turns out, had a vested interest in portraying the fort this way. Well, yeah, he did. A number of his slaves during the War of 1812 had self-liberated and gone to this fort and joined the British there. They were part of garrison of this fort, and he wanted them back. That was part of why he was so anxious to see U.S. troops move against this fort. He wanted his, as he saw it, human property returned to him. And the only way he could make that happen was if he could convince U.S. officials at a higher level than himself to send the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy to attack this fort. He simply could not convince enough Creek Indians to move against this fort to overwhelm it and return his, uh, as he saw them, his slaves to him. And unless he could convince uh, the Army and the Navy to move with great power against this fort, he would never get these self-liberated African Americans to return to bondage and back to work. How accurate was Hawkins about the number of self-liberated blacks that were in the fort from the United States? Most of the people at the fort were from Spanish Florida. They were self-liberated. They had gone to the fort, but they were not from the United States. Uh, Most of the men, women, and children there had come from Pensacola and St. Augustine and the surrounding areas, which at that time, of course, was in uh, Spanish territory. Florida at the time was a Spanish colony, actually two colonies in West Florida. There were a few people there from the United States who had self-liberated from slavery in the United States and gone there, but the vast majority, 90% or more, were from Spanish Florida. The United States did have an issue at the time in the eyes of the Southern leadership 
of people self-liberating themselves from plantations south, but the majority of them were not going to this fort and at least staying there. If they did go there, they may have stopped temporarily just to receive supplies or to rest, and then they were moving on down the peninsula of Florida to the Tampa Bay area or to Angola. Uh, you know, they were trying to get as far away from the U.S. or the Georgia border as they could. Their goal was not to stay at a place like this fort on the Avalanchicola River, which was only 60 miles to, you know, from the Georgia border, where they might be exposed to slave catchers who would come down and try to capture them and return them to bondage. They wanted to get as far away from the U.S. border as they could. The ones from Spanish Florida were not afraid of the United States, so they saw no reason that they needed to flee far from the U.S. borders. So that is the reason that the majority of the Maroons, which is a term for you know escape uh, or self-liberated slaves, were staying at this fort on the Apalachicola is because they just simply weren't afraid of the United States. What was the catalyst for establishing this fort in the first place? When the fort was originally established, it was built in response to a call from Lower Creek and from Seminoles in Miccosukee in Florida and on the Lower Chattahoo River in what is today Alabama and Georgia. At that time, it was part of the Creek Nation, who were concerned because the Creek War of 1813-1814 was spreading over into U.S. territory. And they were concerned that in its retaliations, the United States was not going to differentiate between the Red Sticks, who were at war against U.S. allied factions within the Creek Nation, and all of the rest of the Native Americans on, along the frontier. And they were concerned, and as time would prove, rightfully so, that U.S. troops and frontier militia would attack them as well. And so they sent out an appeal to the British in the Bahamas and asked for military intervention on the Apalachicola and Chattahoochee River. They asked for troops. They asked for military supplies. And so that led to the British High Command in London sending out an authorization for military intervention on the Gulf Coast. This, of course, was the beginning of what we know today as the New Orleans campaign. But the New Orleans campaign began with the arrival of British troops and ships at Apalachicola Bay. And these troops and ships landed uh, supplies for Native Americans at Apalachicola Bay on St. Vincent Island. And then they moved up the Apalachicola River 20 miles to a place called Prospect Bluff. And at this bluff, they began to build this fort and land supplies there for the Seminoles, for the Miccosukee, and for the Creek Indians. That was why this fort was built in the first place. It was built to supply Native American allies of King George. And these were people who had been allied with the king all the way back to the days of the American Revolution. The British saw this as an opportunity to open a new front in the War of 1812. They thought if they could open a front on the, along the Gulf of Mexico, they could seize a great deal of, them, of additional territory before the war came to a close. And if they were holding that territory at the end of the war, they could keep it. And that's the way the British saw it. Where was Spain in all this, with the British building forts on Spanish territory? In the eyes of Spain, Florida was Spanish territory only as far inland as the tidal influence on the rivers or if the Native Americans had by treaty given them specific land. The United States saw this differently. They thought all of Florida, East and West Florida, was Spanish territory. The, the Spanish saw this as a case where the king had great authority over Florida but they saw the land inland beyond the influence of the tides as being Native American land. And so that was their agreement with the Muscogee Nation and with the Seminoles and others. The British thought they had full authority to build this fort because that was their agreement with the Creeks and the Seminoles. They asked for permission to build a fort. The Creeks and Seminoles gave them that permission, and they began to build the fort. They didn't think they needed Spanish authority to build this fort because it was inland past the, the point 
where the uh, tidal influence could be seen on the Apalachicola River. This was in an area known as the Forbes Perch. It was a big area of land that the John Forbes and Company trading firm had basically seized from the Creek Nation for overdue trading debts that many Native Americans felt were exorbitant. And so they, they signed an agreement with the British and rescinded this land agreement with the Forbes Company and then gave the British permission to build a fort there. So the British began building this fort. They felt they fully you know, had the right to do that because the Native Americans told them. And Spain wasn't overly concerned about it. That's the way Spain viewed this. Spain viewed anything beyond the tidal influence as Native American lands and unless they had a specific you know, land session from the Native American. Uh, the United States viewed it all as Spanish Florida. And so therein lay kind of the hitch about this. Spain just really kind of viewed that as a wilderness area, and they just weren't overly concerned with it. Spain had been in possession of Florida for hundreds of years by this point, actually for longer than the United States has been part of Florida today. At the end of the Seven Years' War, as uh, it's called in, in the United States, the French and Indian War, Spain lost control of Florida to Great Britain, but then Spain sided with the United States during the American Revolution. At the end of that, they gained control of Florida back again. Then they kept it until 1821 when the United States gained control of Florida. Even though Spain was neutral in the War of 1812, they were very concerned about the possibility of U.S. invasion. And in fact, the United States, at the time the British arrived in Florida in 1814, the United States was invading West Florida. U.S. troops had crossed the Spanish border and had gone right up almost to gates of uh, Pensacola in pursuit of Red State Creeks who had fled after the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and entered West Florida seeking food and humanitarian supplies from the Spanish government at Pensacola, and U.S. troops were pursuing them and killing them in what was established Spanish territory around Pensacola. Spain had a very small garrison at Pensacola. They were upset about this, but they did not have sufficient military force around Pensacola to do anything about it. And these U.S. mounted troops were crossing into established Spanish territory. They were threatening Spanish citizens. They were killing Native Americans in Spanish territory, and Spain was not happy about that, and they feared that U.S. troops would attack Pensacola. When the British arrived, they were a little bit relieved about the arrival of the British in West Florida, and in fact invited them to come to Pensacola. Even though that was a violation of Spanish neutrality, the Spanish governor of Pensacola felt that it was a way to protect Pensacola from seizure by the United States, which had already violated Spanish neutrality. Okay, so they got permission to have a fort built, but why at that spot on the Prospect Bluffs? They built it there because that's where the Seminoles and Creeks and Miccosukee invited them to come. That's where the Perryman family who issued this appeal for military intervention, that's where they lived. They lived on the Apalachicola River. The Miccosukee, of course, at that time lived on Lake Miccosukee, which is near today's Tallahassee. There was a pathway to Prospect Bluff from there because they traded at a trading post was located there. And so it was a good place that was accessible to all of these groups that had appealed for British help. If they built the fort there, it was going to be a supply depot. The British knew that many of these groups that had called for their help could reach the fort there and could pick up supplies. Because of their neutrality, some dubbed these Native Americans as White Stick Creeks, the Red Stick Creeks being the ones that the United States had made war upon. But this wasn't necessarily the case. The Seminoles and the Miccosukee and and the, the far lower creeks were not really White Stick Creeks in that term. They were to some degree neutral in the war. Some of the Miccosukee had been red state, but at the time the letter was sent uh, requesting British intervention, they hadn't decided yet which way they were going to go in the Creek War. Some of the Miccosukee later did become red sticks, and, but they had been defeated at the Battle of Uchi Creek, as had some of the Tutelosi or the Foul Town people. They also had become red sticks by that point, and so they also had been defeated at the Battle of Uchi Creek. 
country. And then by the time the British arrived, many of the Red Sticks had also arrived on the Apalachicola River and were there by then. So there were a number of the Miccosukee, a number of these far lower creeks had become Red Sticks by this time. And then a number of the Red Sticks had arrived in this same vicinity by the time the British had arrived. The white stick term was not really a term being used at that point. That's sort of a term that later writer took. The Americans considered themselves authorized to pursue them into Spanish territory just because they were their enemies and were not surrendering. And so Andrew Jackson authorized American troops to cross into Spanish territory and pursued them. They were not coming back in and attacking at that point. They were just in full retreat, and their families were starving. They were retreating into Spanish Florida seeking food at that point. They were not still engaged in active combat against the United States. The request for help that had gone out went out from groups prior to them being engaged in the war. Then some of those groups that had requested help did become engaged in the war as the war spread. But the requests went out from groups that had not yet become engaged in the war. And it took about a year, you know, from the time the request went out, it took about a year, you know, for used to travel to Great Britain for the British government to decide what they were going to do and then for the authorization to go out and the ships to arrive. That took about a year's time. And during that year's time was when the Creek War of 1813 to 1814 fought. And the British arrived shortly after the Battle of Houston, which was kind of the big diplomatic battle of the Creek War of 1813-14. And the British arrived not knowing that battle had taken place. So when the British arrived, the climactic battle of the war had been fought, and they arrived just as the Red Sticks were fleeing into Florida. Now, some of the groups that had signed this request for help had never become involved in the war, and they were just trying to do the best they could to feed these refugees who were fleeing into the Florida, the majority of whom were women and children who were simply starving to death. Others were congregating on the Choctahatchee River, which is about halfway between the Apalachicola River and today's Pensacola, and others were congregating along the Escambia and the Yellow River, which are closer to Pensacola. They were just coming down these rivers into Florida. The refugee movement was still underway at the point the British arrived. The British arrived in May of 1814. The Battle of Horseshoe Bend had taken place at the end of March 1814. And so the movement down these rivers through the swamps into Florida was still underway. Help us identify where Prospect Bluff is on a map. Prospect Bluff, if you are coming up the Apalachicola River from the Gulf of Mexico, Prospect Bluff is 20 miles up the river from the Apalachicola Bay. It is the lowest bluff on the river as you're coming upstream that is not subject to the annual floods of the river. So as you come up the river, this bluff, it's a very strategic point. It's not very elevated. It has a peak elevation of about 14 feet above the river. So if you read some books, they describe it as towering bluff. It really is about 14 feet above the river, but it's just not subject to the annual flood of the river. And so it's the first bluff you come to that you could build something on that wouldn't flood during an annual river flood. And so because of that, it was a good place to build a fort or a supply depot. But it also was a spot where the bluff kind of projects out a little bit. And if you build a fort there, you could see downriver for maybe two miles and upriver for about a mile. And so artillery there could command a nice long sweep of the Apalachicola River. So that's why it was a really good strategic point for the British to build a fort. Also, if you're coming down river from on foot or by horse, you can get there during the flooded seasons without getting your feet wet, so to speak. But if you tried to build one any further downstream from there, it would flood. You also wouldn't be able to get to it during the flood season. It's also the river's deep enough up to that point that you get a good-sized schooner up river to that point without it running aground during low water. What was the American presence on the Apalachicola River? 
There was no American military movement on the river at that time. The, the only American fort on the river at that time was way up river at Fort Mitchell, which is just below today's Columbus, Georgia. There was no American supply boats or anything like that going up and down the river at that time. The only commerce using the river at that point was the John Forbes and Company supply schooner would come around and go up. But it only went to their trading post, was at Prospect Bluff. It didn't go any higher than that. The Native Americans now did use the river, and they had the Perryman family and some of the other Native American families did have schooners and sloops that they sailed to the Bahamas and Cuba, and they used the river for commerce, but there was no American commerce going up and down the river at that time. The Treaty of Fort Jackson, which took from the Creek Nation for 20 million acres was eventually going to open up today's South Alabama and Southwest Georgia. And when that happened, which would happen over the next five years from this point, as that happened, then that was, of course, going to open up all of these tens of millions of acres of land. And then the river, the United States did hope to use that river for commerce. Did the Americans view this fort as a thorn in its side in some way? They did not yet because the Treaty of Fort Jackson had not been signed yet. After the War of 1812, they would see it as a thorn in their side. But when it was built, of course, the War of 1812 is underway. At that point, it's just, it's a target because it is an enemy fort near the southern frontier. But you got to remember, when this fort is built, the Treaty of Ghent, of course, has not been signed. The War of 1812 is still underway. So the British built this fort, and then they built a second fort higher up the river. The second fort is just below the Spanish line. They built these two forts, and their plan is to use them as a base for operations against the Georgia frontier. This is going to be part of their plan to invade the state of Georgia. They're using them to begin to train a large auxiliary force of Native Americans for an attack against the Georgia frontier. They eventually organize on the Apalachicola River somewhere around 3,500 Creek, Seminole, and Miccosukee warriors, and they're providing them with light and training sports. They also have a small force of Choctaw there, who had become Red Sticks during the Creek War. They also have organized on the Apalachicola and at Pensacola a battalion of colonial marines. Colonial marines are, for the most part, maroons or self-liberated slaves. Uh, most of them, as I mentioned, are from Spanish Florida. They are fully trained loyal marines. They're called colonial marines because, as the British still do today, they call the United States or America the colony. But they are fully trained Royal Marines. They are given military training. They are trained in a variety of military tactics, including artillery training. And they're planning to use these Marines and these uh, light infantry trained Native Americans as for part of their campaign against Georgia. And they're also going to land a large British military force on Cumberland Island on the Georgia coast. While this force from the Apalachicola River advances against the Georgia frontier, then the force on Cumberland Island is going to advance up the Georgia coast towards Savannah. So that's part of their plan to take Georgia. At the same time, of course, the main British fleet in the Gulf and army is going to attack New Orleans. So you have all of this plan for an attack against the southern United States. British are defeated at New Orleans by Jackson, but they do manage to take Fort Boyer at the mouth of Mobile Bay before word comes that the War of 1812 is over. They also manage to take Cumberland Island. They take St. Mary's at uh, the southern tip of Georgia. From the Apalachicola River, they do launch some attacks on the Georgia frontier before the word comes. These things that they plan to do began to take place and likely would have continued to, despite the defeat at New Orleans had not the Treaty of Ghent been signed or ends. The Treaty of Ghent specified that everyone would return to their pre-war status. The British agree they're going to leave Florida and go back to where they were before the war began. The United States also agreed to that. And as part of the Treaty of Ghent, the British believed that meant the United States were going to abandon their military posts in the Creek Nation and return 
the lands that they had seized at the Treaty of Fort Jackson, which meant that they would abandon their Fort Gaines and other military, Fort Mitchell, other military posts they had built in the Creek Nation. That was why the British lingered a little bit at Prospect Bluff and their other fort in Florida, because they got the word that the war was over in February, and they didn't leave until the end of May. And they kept asking the Americans, when are you leaving? And the Americans kept asking them, when are you leaving? So the British finally left, but the Americans never left. And the Americans made the argument that even though these wars were taking place at the same time, that they weren't the same war, that the Creek War and the War of 1812 weren't part of the same war. Well, of course they were, but the United States kept the land that they seized at the Treaty of Fort Jackson over the arguments of the British. The British weren't willing to reignite the war over it. The Creek were hung out to dry, so to speak. The United States kept the 22 million acres they seized from the Creek Nation. We know the rest is history. Thus began the Trail of Tears. How big was this fort that the British left behind? This place was a huge military post, more along the lines of what you would have seen at a field fortification in Europe at the time. It was built upon the principles of two of the more renowned military engineers who were active in Europe in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. It was a massive 14-acre post. It had an outer entrenchment that enclosed 14 acres. This outer entrenchment uh, consisted of a ditch that ran all the way around it, and inside this ditch was a breastwork that they actually were in the process of strengthening into a massive earthwork. Surrounding this ditch included a system of sluice works that could bring water in from the river, and you could open these sluice gates, and the whole ditch and these ditches also included sluice works that led into the interior of the fort, and you could create a system of flood works that would flood the trenches and ditches to stop an attacking force. It had a system of tiered defense. Inside this outer ditch, there were a series of stockades or wooden walls, and then in the very middle of it was an octagonal citadel. And this citadel consisted of two log walls that were built not up and down like a stockade, but laid horizontally, almost like you would see a log cabin wall, but they were built out of squared logs. They were 18 feet apart, and they were created in the form of a giant octagon. And in between these two log walls, they packed mud in there to the width of 18 feet, so that if you fired a cannon shot at this thing, the cannonball would just be absorbed by the mud. And then they flanked over the top of it, and they mounted cannon up on top of it. At somewhere about 12 feet high was the gun deck of this octagon. They had six and 12 pounders mounted up there. Inside of it was another ring in there where they had barracks for the troops, and they had storehouses and magazine there and such. And that was the Citadel and the Grand Magazine Fort. Then on the river face of the fort, they had a, a redan or a triangular battery right at the right at the crest of the bluff on the river. They could fire where there were 24-pounder and 32-pounder cannon that could fire up and down the river. It had a range of about two miles. These were big naval guns, long guns, they called them. Then they had additional cabanas, is the way the Spanish described them, but they were storehouses, some of them. Some were for the men to live in. There were a variety of other structures there that we know about. Some we only know about from what limited archaeology has been done there, and others we know about from the description of British. We know that they had a portable forge for doing blacksmith type work. One of the more interesting archaeological discoveries was what at first we didn't know what it was. It looked almost like obsidian, but we later found out that it was slag from a glass making operation. So we know they were making glass there. And I thought that was kind of cool. They were making their own glass to make bottles and things there. They had a portable mill where they could grind their own grain there. But they were doing all kinds of things there. It was a pretty fully self-supporting operation they had built there. It had three gunpowder magazines. It had the main one, the grand magazine, in the, in the octagonal citadel. But then there were two other 
powder magazines there. It was a huge complex. It was never completely finished, but it was largely finished by the time the British left. But it was mostly built of earth, and it had a low profile, which meant they were digging down profile low so that it would not be subject to an easy battering by artillery. What came with the British withdrawal, then, from this fort? The British began to withdraw, and they had a number of different regiments and units there. They had a regiment of West Indian troops from Jamaica, and they withdrew those troops. They had a large unit of Royal Marines there. They withdrew those troops. They had sailors from the Royal Navy there. They withdrew those. And then they had uh, this uh, battalion of colonial marines there. Now, they had promised their colonial marines that if they chose to go, they would withdraw them at the end of the war and give them land free land in anywhere or somewhere in the king's dominion. And so they offered them land in Trinidad or in Newfoundland. Some of them went to Newfoundland, and the majority of those who went to Newfoundland found that it would be cold in Newfoundland in the winter. Most of them had come from either Spanish Florida or the Caribbean, and found Newfoundland not to their liking, and eventually relocated back to Trinidad. Some went to Bermuda and served out the rest of a longer hitch in the colonial marines working in the shipyards there, and then went on to Trinidad, and that's where they permanently settled. However, was not enough room in the transport ships for about one of the companies uh, of colonial marines to go. Colonel Nichols, who was the commander of the British fort, spoke with this company of Colonial Marine and told them, if you want to stay here at the fort and stand guard over the supplies we're leaving behind for the American Indians, then we will come back and get you. If you reached agreement with Garcon, who was the sergeant major of the Colonial Marines Battalion, to stay behind in command of the company-sized group of men and their families. And most of them were from Spanish Florida, and so they agreed to stay behind. Garcon would stay in command, and they would maintain military discipline. They would continue to do their daily drills and things like that. So they would stay behind. They would garrison the fort, but they and their families would spread out and clear farms and they would be able to feed themselves until the British could come back and evacuate them about a year later. That's what happened. Everyone else evacuated. Two-thirds of the black colonial marines, and I say black colonial marines, they were not all African descent. There were some of European descent. There were some of Spanish descent. The rest of them all went to Trinidad for the most part. Uh, but about 80 men and somewhere around 200 or so women and children remained behind, along with about 20 Choctaw warriors and their family remained behind at Prospect Club, a total of maybe 320. Different. I think that the ones who stayed behind really did not think they had anything to fear from the United States. The majority of them were not from the United States. They were from Spanish Florida. They considered themselves Spanish citizens. Before the British left, they went to Pensacola, they went to St. Augustine, they reimbursed their former quote-unquote owners in silver so that there was no economic claim against them, there was no moral claim against them, they had been paid for. And so the British didn't think anyone had a claim against them, these Maroons who lived there didn't think anyone had a claim against them. The United States certainly didn't have a claim against them because they weren't from the United States, other than, than a small handful. Anyone who had been there who was from the United States, again, other than a small handful, had gone on down into the peninsula of Florida. Garcon, the commander of the fort, he definitely was not from the United States. The vast majority of the others were from Pensacola. In fact, even the ones at the fort that we know about who were from the United States, had come from Spanish Pensacola. They were living with people there who had left the United States and settled in Spanish Pensacola. The people who claimed them at the time they left Pensacola and went to Prospect Bluff were former U.S. citizens who had sworn allegiance to Spain, and they had been paid for them by the British. When the British departed, they left behind some of their colonial marines, and a huge stockpile of ammunition and weapons. 
the gunpowder and the muskets and the rifles and the things like that left at the fort they had given to the Creeks and the Seminoles of the Mississippi. That was the property of the Native Americans. They had, in the terms of their agreement with the Native Americans, had agreed to give them this support as part of their exchange they made with them for supporting them during the War of 1812. All of that material belonged to the Native Americans who lived there in the Big Ben region of Florida. And they used that. They would go back there occasionally and pick up new supplies used for hunting, things like that. And if they needed a new musket or a new rifle or something like that, they could go to the fort and get one. It was their military heart and stockpile. But they had agreed. They had signed an agreement with the British to no longer engage in warfare with the United States. And that agreement held for the next year after the British left. So this is the backdrop for the conflict. What caused the conflict to go hot, as we say? The conflict that began in July of 1816 started when U.S. Brigadier General Edwin P. Gant ordered Lieutenant Colonel Duncan Lamont Clinch. Now, these are names that anyone familiar with the Second Seminole War is going to know these individuals very well. Gaines ordered Clinch move down the Chattahoochee River from Fort Gaines and build a new fort at the confluence of Chattahoochee River and Blair Rivers. This fort was initially called Camp Crawford. It would soon become known as Fort Scott. And, of course, Fort Scott was later the command post during the First Seminole War. Gaines wanted this fort that was all U.S. officials were now calling the Negro Fort destroyed. No one who actually ever occupied the fort ever called it that. It's often called that today, but at the time that it was occupied, no one who ever lived at the fort ever called it that. The British called it the British Post or the British Fort at Prospect Bluff or just Prospect Bluff. The Maroons who lived there usually just called it the Bluff, and that's what their descendants in Trinidad call it today. They generally tend to call it the Bluff. So Gaines ordered Clinch to make his move down to the confluence of the Chattanooga Blair River. At the same time, for the first time, he instructed two supply vessels to prepare to leave New Orleans with supplies for American forces on the Chattahoochee River. And they were going to go around through the Gulf of Mexico to Apalachicola Bay and go up the Apalachicola River to the confluence of the Chattahoochee and Flint Rivers with supplies for this American coast. Now, never before had the United States ever used the Apalachicola River to carry supplies to its forces on the Chattahoochee. This is going to be the first time that that's ever been done. In fact, they don't even know if they can navigate the Apalachicola River. No one knows if it's navigable by vessels of this size. But Gaines has made the determination that this is how they're going to supply this new fort. So he sends these two vessels, the General Pike and the Similante, which are contracted vessels with supplies and artillery for this new fort that he has ordered Clinch to build. Because he knows that this fort is 20 miles up the river, he orders two 18-pounders to be placed on these ships. And these two 18-pounders are going to serve to batter down the walls of this fort if it resists in any way these two supply ships. He also requests from the New Orleans Naval Station that two warships or gun vessels be assigned to escort these two supply ships sends a request to Commodore Daniel Patterson at New Orleans, and Patterson assigns gunboats 149 and 154. These are two of these small Jeffersonian gunboats. They are at Pass Christian, and they are assigned to go with the two uh, supply ships to the Apalachicola River and to assist them in getting past the fort. They are instructed that if they are resistant in any way to knock down this fort for the instructions given. Do the British still have that post that's north of it, just south of the border with Georgia? It is not. It has been evacuated by the British when they left the Apalachicola River, so it is not still occupied. There are some trace of it still there, but it is no longer occupied. The Americans are not sure if they're going to have safe passage up the Apalachicola River, past the fort at Prospect Bluff. 
They don't know. They are hoping that they will be. And that's what James has told Clint. He has told Clinch that if you are resisted in any way, use that as an opportunity to destroy the sport and to return the quote-unquote slaves to their owners. He also tells Clinch that I've instructed these gunboats and these ships to come around to Apalachicola as soon as you receive word that they're there, move down the river with your entire available force, and prepare for battle. Now, it's often been said that Andrew Jackson ordered the destruction of this fort. You'll read the historians today who write that he led the attack himself. Jackson was nowhere near there. Jackson had written the governor of Pensacola asking him what he was going to do about it, but Jackson was not the one who gave this order. He did express support for it, and he did write to the Secretary of War saying, I hope Gaines has dealt with it by now. He did not give the direct order for the destruction of the fort. Gaines was the one who did it. Gaines was the major general with operational command in this area. But Jackson, I'm sure, had no major objections to it. And had Jackson felt authorized to, I'm sure he would have given the order. But Gaines was the one who moved to do this. The ships make their way around in July 1816. When they arrive at the bay, they find a Tukabachi chief named John Blunt awaiting at Apalachicola Bay for them. As soon as he links up with them, he tells them to wait there in the bay, and he's going to go up river and let Clinch know they're there, and that's what he does. Dale, thanks for setting the stage for what was at stake at this fort at Prospect Bluff. We will continue this discussion to examine the actual attack on the fort at Prospect Bluff and the aftermath. Thanks again for joining us for The Seminole Wars. I enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.summonawars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation, 2022. All rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden. Roast em, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.